Welcome to the online worship service for the First Presbyterian Church of Ambler. My name is Ryan Balson. I'm the pastor here, and I am so glad that you have joined us for worship today. I want to remind you that today, November 1st, is All Saints Day. So that means we will be remembering those who have died this past year, and also we'll be giving thanks for all those who have gone before us. I also have a couple other things I want to remind you of that are happening in the life of our church. First of all, this Sunday is Communion Sunday, so we will be gathering online on Zoom for communion immediately following this service. If you're watching it on Sunday morning, so I invite you to join us. At the end of the service, there will be a link on the screen that you can type into your browser and join us on Zoom. Also, next Sunday, November 8th, we will be regathering in our sanctuary for worship. If you intend to join us, you'll need to sign up online. The link came out on Thursday in our weekly email. If you did not receive that, reach out to the church office and we'll send it to you. But I do want to let you know that spaces are filling up quickly. We will also have a live stream at 9 o'clock. And in addition to that, you can watch the live stream anytime throughout the day after the live stream is over on our church website. You can also see it on YouTube and Facebook as well. If you want to know the other things that are happening in the life of our church, I invite you to visit our website, www.fpcambler.org, where you can learn about all the things that God is doing in and through us here.
Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. We worship the God of eternity, the God of the saints, who is stronger than the elements, brighter than the shadows, stronger than our fears, and stronger than the dark powers that assail us. Let us worship God. In Paul's letter to the Romans, he talks about the inner conflict between God's spirit and our human nature. He says, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. We too know what is right, and we want to do it, but our human nature causes us to do what we know is wrong. Is there no hope for us? Of course not. Scripture teaches us that we can find help in Jesus Christ, who shared our human nature in order to destroy the power that sin has over us. Let us now be united with Christ by confessing our sins. Through confessions, we can be renewed and our lives can be controlled by God's Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious God, we confess to you that we often believe that we can make it on our own. We think that we can make it through every situation without your help or the aid of the people around us. We do not acknowledge your leading or use your gifts. Forgive us, Lord, for believing that we are self-sufficient without you. Enable us by the power of your Holy Spirit to hear and know your voice to follow your leading, and to obey your word. Teach us to honor the gifts that you have given to us and others. Strengthen our faith and give us the desire and ability to serve you in all that we do. And now hear our own prayers of confession. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The psalmist once asked God, will your anger never cease? Show us your constant love, O Lord, and give us your salvation. We know that God will not be angry with us forever. God has shown us his constant love. He has given us our salvation 
through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that our sins are removed. We have been given new life. People of God rejoice greatly, for I tell you that in Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. Go forth, therefore, to live in peace. Peace with God, peace within yourself, and peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Sometimes you long for the good old days. When I think of the good old days, I'm thinking back to February of this year, back before the coronavirus struck, when we could have small talk and talk about ordinary things like our weekend plans or the weather. These days, though, it seems like all of our small talk focuses around two different topics, the election and the coronavirus. Now, fortunately, after Tuesday or Maybe a little after that, the election will be behind us, but the coronavirus, unfortunately, will be with us for some time. And one of the things that we've been reading about and hearing about with the coronavirus over and over again is that it's leading to something else, not just the disease and the sickness that it brings, it's also leading to burnout. Now, burnout is a term that was coined in a book in 1974. It was actually written in a business book. But it's something that has existed far longer than those mere 46 years. The definition of burnout is this, that burnout is a reaction to prolonged or chronic stress and is characterized by three main dimensions, exhaustion, cynicism, and feelings of reduced ability. I think many of us have experienced some level of burnout. And and, and part of the reason is that all these barriers that have been set up that divided our lives into different segments have been taken down over the last seven months. I was talking to a friend of mine who told me at first he was happy when he was able to work at home at the beginning of the virus. He said, but then he quickly discovered that this barrier between work and home had been broken down and suddenly it felt like he was always at work and never at home. 
How many of you have felt that way? That this barrier between work and home has been broken down? And not just work, school and home, childcare and work, work and our other daily responsibilities. It seems sometimes that we are eating every meal in our workplace. Some of us, like me, often end up working in my bedroom. So I wake up and I almost immediately go right to work at a desk in my room. It is exhausting. But as I said, burnout, although it was a term coined in 1974, is hardly anything new. And this morning we're going to look at a passage that speaks about Moses who was getting close to the point of burnout. So we're going to learn a a little bit about how to strategize around that. But even more importantly than that, we're going to learn something important because Moses received a key piece of advice that came from an unexpected place, from his father-in-law Jethro, who is a priest of Midian. So before we read this scripture, let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you have given us your word, and in your word you teach us and you challenge us and you stretch us. Lord, we pray that we would, as we hear your word, we would also hear your voice speaking by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, that you would open our ears that we might hear, open our hearts that we might receive your word, open our minds that we might understand it. Lord, that you would, by your Spirit, give us the ability to listen, to respond, and to be obedient. And Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we're actually reading two passages. The first is from Exodus 18, verses 13 through 27. And then we're going to read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Listen to the word of the Lord. The next day Moses sat as judge for the people, while the people stood around, from, stood around him from morning until evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone while all the people stand around you from morning until evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make known to them the statutes and the instructions of God. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you're doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you. For the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Now listen to me. I will give you counsel. And God be with you. You should represent the people before God. And you should bring their cases before God. Teach them the statutes and instructions and make known to them the way they are to go and the things they are to do. You should also look for able men among the people, men who fear God, are trustworthy and hate dishonest gain. Set such men over them as officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Let them sit as judges for the people at all times. Let them bring every important case to you. But decide every minor case themselves, so it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, and so God commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all these people will go to their home in peace. So Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men from Israel and appointed them as heads over the people, his officers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And they judged the people at all times. Hard cases they brought to Moses, but any minor case they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went off to his own country. And our second passage is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we saw in our passage that burnout has been a problem that has been with us for a long, long time. Moses, it tells us, was sitting there judging every dispute for all the people. It says from morning until evening. Talk about not having a break. Talk about not having a barrier and any work-life balance. Moses was living it. He was in the midst of deciding every little thing. Now, I'm not one who believes that the Bible is full of simple answers to complex questions, but sometimes there are passages where the answers are lying so close to the surface it just seems obvious. And this passage seems to be one of those particular passages. Moses is nearing the point of burnout. He's wearing himself out, making every decision. And along comes his father-in-law, Jethro. And what he says to him is this, what you're doing is not good. You will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you, for the task is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. Most of us probably know something of that experience of trying to do too much and doing it all on our own, thinking that we're so important, that our position is so critical that no one can do what we can do. One of the things that causes this is perhaps a touch of of hubris or arrogance, this belief that we can do better what we need to do than anybody else, and it can keep us from delegating. Now, the text doesn't tell us whether Moses believed this or not, but it seems likely that this was one of the things that motivated Moses, that his job, in his own mind, was to be the judge of the people, to make decisions between them, and to help them settle their disputes. But Moses had taken on too much. And one of the things that we discover in his father-in-law's advice is this. Not only had he taken on too much, but there were two things with that. Number one, he was going to wear himself out. He was going to burn out. He was going to get exhausted. He was going to, from chronic stress, he was going to be exhausted. He might become cynical. And he might even have feelings that his abilities are not as great as he had thought they were. But there's another piece of this as well. In verse 19, Jethro says, you should represent the people before God and bring their cases before God. Moses' job was not simply to settle disputes between one Israelite and another. His main calling was to be the voice that spoke for the people before the Lord. What happened by taking on too much is that he actually missed out on his main and most important responsibility. And isn't that what happens so often in life? When we take on too much, how many of us have had that feeling that we have so much on our plates that we never do anything as well as we want to? How many of us have so much on our plates or have taken on so much responsibility that we don't prioritize the things that matter most? How many of us have ignored important responsibilities that we have. Our families, our spouses, our friends, because we've taken on so much responsibility, so many tasks, we can't get to the important work of tending and building vital relationships. Jethro's advice was good advice, and it's advice that could be given at almost any time. It's advice that you could, you could fill a book talking about how to live it out. But one of the things that Jethro is telling him, and I believe that God is telling us through this conversation that's shown between Jethro and Moses, is that it's important for us to make sure that we have our priorities straight, that we have things set up in such a way that we are able to do the things that matter the most. So perhaps one way to respond to burnout is to simply prioritize the things that matter most and and decide for ourselves what it is that really matters and what we are expected, what we are called to do. 
And in Moses' case, some of this was delegation, but some of it was also learning that most important two-letter word, no. There's a second thing, though, that I think is also vital in Jethro's advice to Moses. In verse 18, Jethro says this. He says, you will surely wear yourself out, both you and these people with you. Now, we've already thought about how Moses could be worn out, but Jethro also warns him that he can wear the people out as well. He will tire them out. Maybe they'll be tired of hearing his voice alone. Maybe they'll be tired of waiting for him because he's taken so much on for himself that he can't get to everybody's case. Or maybe they'll be tired of his leadership because if he takes too much on for himself, He doesn't open the door for other people to use their gifts and their talents and their skills, things that God has given them. And he will short-circuit this process of raising up other leaders and of, of building other people up and enabling them to use the gifts that God has given. This is one of those important things about burnout that's often missed. We often think about burnout as something that's individual and it affects us, and it does. But we also have to remember that burnout can affect the people around us as well. It has an impact beyond just our own lives. There's also one other important thing in this passage that scholars have pointed out. From the very beginning of biblical interpretation and in early Christian interpretation, the main question that people ask is this, How is it that Moses would need advice from an outsider like Jethro? Now, earlier in chapter 18, there's some sort of a conversion of Jethro where he becomes a worshiper of the Lord, but he had been a longtime priest of Midian, and we don't know exactly who the Midianite god was. But we do know that that Jethro was a Midianite priest. In many ways, he was an outsider, I think one of the things this teaches us, though, and that Christian interpretation over the centuries has reminded us of, is how important it is for us to listen to outside voices. You know, there's always someone out there who will tell you to do more, to take more on, and to add more responsibility. But sometimes it's so vitally important for us to have the discipline to listen to outside voices from someone outside the system This is part of the importance of of being part of a diverse community. One of the beauties and the strengths of diversity is that we get to hear voices that we wouldn't normally hear. We get to hear perspectives that we on our own would never consider. We get to hear the wisdom of others. Now, one of the things I find so impressive about this passage in Moses' response is his incredible humility. You know, Moses could very easily have said to Jethro, listen, I'm the Lord's representative. You don't need to tell me what to do. But instead, we're told that in this passage, Moses listened to his father-in-law and did all that he said. That's what it tells us in verse 24. He listened to his father-in-law and he did all that he said. I often think that one of the most overlooked Christian virtues is the ability to have our mind changed, to hear new information, and to turn and to go in a different direction. I know I've said it before, but in the New Testament, the word for repentance actually means to turn around and go in a different way. I think at the center of the Christian gospel is this idea that we can repent, we can turn, and we can go in new directions. And some of that is being open-minded enough to listen to other voices and to hear other people speak. You know, this is All Saints Day, and on All Saints Day, we are reminded of our unity in Christ, not just with those who are living, but those who are dead, and our unity with those who will come in generations after us. In the passage we read from Hebrews, 
the writer says that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So therefore, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. I love that passage because it's a reminder that the Christian life is not a solo effort, but it's a group project. (laughs) It's something that we do together. Moses was reminded by his father-in-law, Jethro, that leadership of God's people and being faithful to our calling is not a solo project, but we need each other. We need each other to make it through. We need to hear diverse voices so that we can hear and discern the word of the Lord. We need to pay attention when someone speaks with the possibility that by the words of another, with input from the scripture and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, that our minds could indeed be changed. We need this great cloud of witnesses leading us forward, teaching us, guiding us, correcting us, encouraging us, and strengthening us. I think if there's one thing that we've learned during this pandemic, it's this, that God did not intend for us to go it alone. We need each other. We need as human beings to do life together. We need as a church to do ministry together. So today I challenge you to think about your priorities. What is it that really matters to you? What is it that's most important? What is it that's critical for you to do? What is it that you can set aside so you can focus on the things that matter? There are many tasks that are too heavy for us. We cannot do it alone. But thanks be to God that he has given us the gift of each other. So let us pray for one another. Let us support one another. Let us carry one another. Let us challenge one another. Let us encourage each other so that we can all live into the calling that God has given. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that you have given us this precious gift of one another. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be open-minded and to listen to those who have a different perspective, not prejudging, but trusting that you sometimes speak from places that we would not expect. Lord, we pray that in all that we do, we would be faithful to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in our profession of faith, which comes from the second Helvetic Confession. And just so you know, Helvetic means Swiss, and this confession was written in 1561. Let us confess our faith together. We acknowledge saints to be living members of Christ and friends of God who have gloriously overcome the flesh and the world. Hence, we love them as brothers and also honor them, yet not with any kind of worship, but by an honorable opinion of them and just praises of them. We also imitate them. For with ardent longings and supplications, we earnestly desire to be imitators of their faith and virtues, to share eternal salvation with them, to dwell eternally with them in the presence of God, and to rejoice with them in Christ. And in this respect, we approve of the opinion of St. Augustine, Let not our religion be the cult of men who have died, for if they have lived holy lives, they are not to be thought of as seeking such honors. On the contrary, they want us to worship him by whose illumination they rejoice that we are fellow servants of his merits. They are therefore to be honored by way of imitation, but not to be adored in a religious manner. Amen. Today, November 1st, is All Saints Day. In our Book of Common Worship, All Saints Day is described this way. It says, All Saints Day is a time to rejoice in all who through the ages have faithfully served the Lord. The day reminds us that we are part of one continuing, living communion of saints. Today we give thanks for the communion of saints. We give thanks for those who have gone before us, who faithfully bore witness to the good news of the gospel. And today we remember 
the saints from our congregation who have died in this past year. You can see their names listed in an insert that is um, on our website that you can look at and you can see their names. But the people that we lost this year are Lois Dom, who was a faithful saint, a longtime member of the First Presbyterian Church of Ambler, and she served as a docent at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And Corrine Jones, she was originally from Texas, but she moved here when she was married to Charlie. She was a faithful church member, a Christian witness, not only to her community, but also to her family. Paul Furnival. Paul used to sit in this particular spot in our sanctuary where the lighting system was located. He always worked the lights and Paul was a faithful attender and member of our church for many years. And one of the things I love is there's this picture of Paul in the kitchen of our church with an apron on and a bow tie, working, preparing a meal. And he served in the kitchen for many years. And Bob Miller, an active member engaged in the life of our church for so many years. One of the things about Bob that I'll always remember is not only his faithful servanthood, but also the fact that he would always remind me of how long my sermon was on Sunday. But he also told me, he said, it doesn't matter how long it is as long as it's good. So I guess I took that as a bit of a challenge. And Don Roan was a gentle, quiet, capable, and creative soul and a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. Ina Morgan, she was quiet too, but she sat kind of on the opposite side from where Paul Furnival sat with Bob Rogers every week, and she was such a faithful member of this congregation. Walter King, he was a quiet, humble servant who served the Lord in this place for so many years. Herb Roth, he was a florist. The Roth family for many years has provided the beautiful flowers in our sanctuary. And Roth loved his family, he loved this church, and he loved the Lord. And Arlene Crowell, another faithful servant, a nurse, a painter, a potter, and she was someone who loved traveling with her husband, Dick. And Rachel Sigmund, gentle, prayerful. One of the things I will always remember about Rachel is that if you know me, you know I'm not really a hugger, but she was a person who always insisted on a hug, and every Sunday when Rachel was here, Rachel and I would hug Rachel in the narthex of our church. Even though it's not my thing, she had a compelling way about her. And Linda Roth. Linda was, had a great sense of humor a wonderful, faithful disciple. I sat for quite a few hours with her in Bible study. David Horner was someone who believed in community service. He was over 50 years involved in Kiwanis here in Ambler. He was an avid learner. He was a skier, a loving father, grandfather, and husband. And Samuel Kay, a servant, an elder, If you talk to Sam Kay, he was a Civil War and Abraham Lincoln encyclopedia. But one of the things about Sam is that he used his knowledge not simply as a hobby, but he used it as something to make connections with other people. Today, we give thanks for all of these saints who have gone before us. As we give thanks for these saints, I'm going to pray a prayer that comes from the Lindisfarne community. This is a Christian community in Northumbria in the northeast of England on a holy island. So please join me as we give thanks for the saints who have gone before us. We thank you that in your saints of yesterday and today, we see the many splendored facets of human life flowing in their fullness. We thank you for those who give their all in the service of others, overcome heroic odds with nobility of spirit, are gracious in defeat and magnanimous in triumph, are content with the little things and show us how to truly love. Lord, this morning or today, we give you thanks for Lois Dom, for Corrine Jones, for Paul Furnival, for Bob Miller, for Donald Roan, for Ina Morgan, 
for Walter King, for Herbert Roth, for Arlene Crowell, for Rachel Sigmund, for Linda Roth, for David Horner, and for Samuel Kay. Spurred on by them, we offer you our talents and our tasks, our trials and our triumphs. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you haven't received it yet, you will very soon receive an estimate of giving card in the mail. We are in our stewardship season at the First Presbyterian Church of Ambler, and we recognize that this has been an, well, an unusual year. But in the midst of this unusual year, we are so grateful for your ongoing generosity. It has enabled us to carry on in ministry. It's enabled us to have staff who have been thinking creatively about how to reach out to our community and to our congregation in the midst of difficult times. It has enabled us to continue to partner with our mission partners here in Ambler and around the world. Just this past week, we received a letter of gratitude from Interfaith Housing Alliance telling us of all the good work that has been done at Hope Forest, the house that our congregation purchased and gave to Interfaith Housing Alliance, and how it's been critical in helping, helping several people live independently and move out into a home of their own. What a precious gift we have given by responding to God's goodness to us. So I invite you in the coming weeks to prayerfully consider what you intend to give in 2021. Now we know that it is an unusual time, so it's an estimate of giving. But I also invite you to consider the 60-day tithe challenge. This is an opportunity to practice the spiritual practice of tithing, the biblical mandate of giving 10% of what you earn, and to do it for 60 days. And during that time, to ask God to bless you and to show you his faithfulness and his provision. So friends, I invite you to give with joy and generosity to the work of the Lord that happens in this place and from here throughout our community and throughout the world. You can give by going online and giving online, or you can also write a check and mail it to the church. Thanks again for your generosity.
Friends, God has given us this precious gift of one another. He intends for us to live life and to serve him together as a community, as a team. It means that we need to be open-minded enough to listen to each other. It means that we need to be open to the gift of surprise, of hearing an encouraging or a challenging word from a place that we had not expected, but to discover that sometimes God speaks to us in ways that we would not have anticipated. And it demands that we be grateful, grateful for the people and the community that God has put into us, to our lives. So let us live with joy and with gratitude, with open hearts, knowing that God has called us to live this Christian life together. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.